Welcome to the Swim Swam Podcast. I'm your host, Coleman Hodges, joining us today. You've heard from him before. We've talked to him several times. I'm so excited to sit down with him once again. He is now a nine-time Olympic medalist. He's walking away with two silvers and a bronze from the Paris Olympic Games. He, fun fact, he also split at least 47 in the 100 freestyle seven times over the course of the nine-day Olympic competition in Paris. We're sitting down with the, the king, Kyle Chalmers himself. Kyle, thanks so much for taking the time. How's it going, man? It is good. I'm uh, having a little relax, relax over in Norway at the moment, so I'm living my best life, which is good. It's a good way to unwind after a crazy period of time. This episode of the Swim Swam podcast is sponsored by Commit Swimming, Swim Swam's exclusive team management software partner. Since 2015, Commit has been providing coaches with swimming's leading workout management software. And now, Commit has team management software too. Commit wants to help you make the switch from Team Unify to a simpler, more powerful solution. Their onboarding and customer service team will walk you through every step of the way. Check them out at commitswimming.com to book your demo today. That's C-O-M-M-I-T swimming.com. Thanks for that stat about the 747s or under 47, well, one under 47. Yeah. <laughs> um, it's funny doing media and finding out those little facts that you just aren't aware of until the competition's over, you know what I mean? Like we just don't keep that stat or keep up to date with those sorts of things until I guess the media who's following it actually. <laughs> it's always it's always interesting finding out those little little things. So thanks for that, mate. Absolutely. Yeah. I was, you know, I was I was preparing for this right before and I was just kind of looking over your results and how you had done in Paris. And I was like, hang on a second. Like, you know, it's like you know, how many 46s and you you know, as you mentioned, you had the one on the foreign free relay that netted yeah. silver for Australia. And then I was like, well, how many, like how many hundred freeze did he like log, you know? And it's like, you, you had a busy week yeah. for, for only having one individual event. Right. <laughs> it is busy. And it's so hard. I think being a hundred freestyler and knowing you're on day one, but then you're also on day nine. So being able to stay fresh and ready for nine days is a huge challenge mentally, physically, emotionally, like, there's so many guys on the team that are there for one race and it's like maybe they maybe they just swim the heat and they don't progress to the semifinals and then their competition's over like a lot of my we had eight guys in my apartment most of my apartment is done by halfway through the competition and i'm oh, like wow. I'm holding on holding on they're all starting to party and unwind and see their family and friends and enjoy themselves enjoy the village enjoy being a part of the olympic experience and i'm still there just trying to do everything i can to possibly swim as fast as i can for my team in the medley relay on the last night um it's hugely important to me um so yeah it was challenging i i actually went down with rhinovirus which i'm not really sure exactly what that is but i was sick the last three days of competition so my last three days of competition were very very challenging for me in terms of that but um yeah i feel i feel better now which is good i'm pretty sure it's just pretty much a nasally cold i i thought that um because a lot of the australian team members had COVID, i thought oh, i better do a test just because i don't want to infect my roommate matthew temple who was still swimming in the butterfly yeah so i went a test and it was luckily just pretty much all rhinovirus so um i'm not sure whether he ended up getting it but um they moved me to a hotel and which was quite nice to get out and uh relax leading into those last few days of racing but yeah very challenging and but very proud of how the week went and proud to be able to stand up and deliver in those relays my absolutely yeah, I'm the, yeah, I've, I've got so much to unpack here. So, so rhinovirus is like a common cold there. Are, I mean, I guess that's what, what we, we'd call it here in the States, but, um, it, there was a lot of, it, I feel like this was the COVID Olympics, right? Just because so many people were getting COVID and, and you had so much, um, seemingly just illness going around. Right. And because this was, I mean, this is our first Olympics post pandemic, um, but there was also just so many other factors you heard about the, the buses, um, the food, like g just getting into Paris and settling in outside of the pool. How do you feel like you dealt with 
all of the outside factors, as well as, like you said, having to be on your game for, for nine whole days. Yeah. I think I'm very lucky that I've been to three Olympics now. So I'm expecting that the conditions aren't going to be ideal. I think it's hard, it's hard for me. Like I've got so many mates. Like I remember having a conversation with one of my teammates and they were kind of complaining about the bus situation and the food and the beds. And it's like, Oh, looking forward to swimming on until LA 2028. So we can have a more positive experience. And I'm like, for me, I find (laughs) that very hard because I'm like, I've got mates you know, living over in, living back in Australia who are living in caravans and doing it really tough. And I'm on an all expenses paid trip to the, to France for the Olympic games. Like <laughs> I've got a bed, I've got bus transport to the, like I've got free food. Like for me, I think it's one of the most incredible experiences. So I'm never going to talk negatively of it and complain about it. But, um, and I think it builds character too. Like you have to be able to everyone's in that same same situation you know there's every single swimmer that was there was in that village everyone's eating the same food everyone's having the same bus rides to the pool everyone's got the same bed like we're all going through it together so i think it makes it very even for the competition so um yeah for me i i loved loved that experience and built that resilience and i mean i got paid to be at the olympic games i think it's i think there's no better thing like it's yeah it's it's incredible really but i think the sickness was the most challenging thing like we as an australian team were testing because um we had the antiviral medication so that if people were to get COVID, we could get them on the medication really quickly mm-hmm. and hopefully get them back into the sporting field quicker which meant that they were testing everyone all the time whereas i think most countries weren't weren't testing they were kind of just whatever happens happens get on with it and we we got to the village and within the first day there was a couple of people go down with COVID, and then just the stress that that causes amongst the team, like people wearing masks and hand sanitizing and that whole COVID kind of coming back up. I mean, I think Australia, we were very lucky that COVID didn't hit Australia all that hard. So for us in our head, COVID's still this very bad disease almost, you know, like we didn't experience it like you guys or Europe or we kind of were very lucky. So it's all very new to us still probably and to an extent, but um, mm-hmm. most people that had COVID were able to race and race really well still. And, obviously yeah got the cold um which was annoying but still but still able to race and perform just feel a bit average but you always feel average after nine days of competition anyway so uh, i couldn't work out whether i was getting sick or just exhausted from nine days of racing (laughs) i mean i uh the last several like uh international competitions that i've covered you know i'm not even competing i'm just covering them yeah. I've gotten sick after them <laughs> yeah. just because, you know, it's like you're on for so long, you know, yeah, you're right? right? I think um, it, that happens to me all the time, like competitions, every competition towards the end of the meet, I get sick and it's just like, I think as you just train so hard and your body is on for those months leading into it and then, then you race and your body starts to relax and be like, oh, I've just, I've achieved what I wanted to achieve and then it starts to try to like, yeah unwind a little bit but then you still got days of racing to go but i get sick it's so annoying but um at least i prepare myself well for that now um but it always happens it always happens to everyone and you know like it's you're caffeining up you're going through all the emotions the highs and lows of competition then you're trying to go back and sleep and you might sleep three hours if you're lucky and might not nap the next day because you've got to race again and the brain is just overpowering the body and it's it's a crazy nine days like it's it's a marathon really yeah Uh, how do you you know again this is your third olympics you've you've done plenty of competitions like this before um how do you try to unwind especially in those moments where it's like okay i need to recover you know i I need to try to sleep at least i've got way better at it i think just because i'm getting older my body needs to sleep like i remember being in rio and the 100 freestyle heat semi i was so happy after the semi-final i didn't sleep at all that night we raced at 11 p.m that following night i didn't sleep just sat there playing <laughs> playstation like didn't sleep that whole 24 hours and i could get away with it like you feel yeah. completely fine i've had to move obviously with internet problems but um yeah so for me i break down the competition a lot more in terms of it's a nine day competition i know exactly what to expect so it's like day one i had the four by one 100 freestyle heat and final um And I know that if I don't sleep all that well that night, it's okay because then I had two days completely off where I could sleep in, I could go home and nap, I could have early nights. I didn't have to go to the competition pool and be stimulated by competition. I could go to the training pool and 
float through and do my own thing. So that was really good for me. And then I had the heat and semi of the 100 freestyle and final. And I know that through that period, it's like, well, again, I can I can draw back to Rio and go, I didn't sleep at all through that period. I mean, if I don't get all that much sleep, I'm going to be okay. Like I know that I've slept and banked so much sleep in this period of time that if I don't sleep a huge amount, I'll be okay. But I slept really well. Like I think I'm getting older. So I napped, I slept, I did really well, napped on the day of the final. And then, and then again, had another day off and then started the relays and um, obviously had three uh, relays the last three days of competition. But I think it just was really well broken up for me this this time around that um, I was able to sleep and unwind and reset. And I'm lucky to have had my family over there on the same time zone. So to be able to speak to them on the phone or one of my best mates, who's my roommate, Matthew Temple, like have him and just be able to talk about normal things at home or my fiance was in Paris also. So just being able to speak to her and connect and stuff is the way that I like to unwind now is just having normal conversations with people away from the pool. And, um, and then, yeah, when I'm at the pool, step back into the, into the sporting sporting arena and get all that energy that comes with the stimulation of competition. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and, and let's, let's break down some of those competition days. Um, the just, or I guess, just going into into the meet, uh, get, like you said, four hundred free relay on day one. Um, how were you feeling? You know, you, you ended up splitting. You anchored for Australia. You split forty six five silver medal. But how were you? Pretty confident at that point, having having only had the prelim swim um, to get yeah. into the meet. Not at all. I think this is the first competition I've really gone into being probably lacking com- lacking confidence for what I normally would be. Like my trials didn't go nearly as well as I would have hoped in terms like I was 47-7 injured with my back and I was sick at that competition, which sucked, but I really still wanted to deliver a really good swim at trials to build my confidence up into the competition, which normally I'm able to do. Um, And I really felt like at trials, I gave everything to that race and it was was slow that probably affected my confidence a little bit. but I was lucky to have a really good training block leading into the games. Yeah, my back, I'm still managing that injury, but it was better than what it was leading into trials. So that was nice. But uh, it probably wasn't until I did the heat of the relay that I was able to build my confidence up. And I think that's why I'm so lucky that we always have the four by one freestyle on day one is because that I swim my best in relays. I love being a part of the relay. I love the pressure being on me. That's why I want to put my hand up and be in the heat in the morning and be like, hey, I want to, make sure we get through to the final in a good lane. So yeah, I'll swim the heat and I'll go last to be able to kind of conduct that. And I swam the heat and I swam really, really well, like I was 47.4 and it was a very controlled, easy swim because we were out in front and I knew that I could relax and enjoy it. And it gave me so much confidence going into the final because I was like, oh, well, this morning I was 47.4. Like I got to put in, put in a lot more tonight and I knew that I could swim a lot faster and to be 46.5 or 46.6, I'm not sure what it was. Yeah. Um, was definitely faster than I'd expected to go, especially watching that first night of finals. Like I'm a massive swimming fan. So I'm like warming up watching finals and it was pretty slow, like most across the board really um, time wise that people were starting to go, oh yeah, it's a slow pull. Uh, and then I watched Pan dive in for the, he was first <laughs> in that four by one freestyle and was 46. And I was thinking this pool isn't slow. Like this is, this kind of competition's unfolding. So um yeah fast to get silver was amazing like there's a couple of young guys in that relay that i'm really excited about their future future and then jack cartwright's the same age as me that we've been around together through all our junior teams and both born in 98 so for him to be on his first olympic team and be able to stand on the podium with him was special and um the last two olympics we've got bronze so to be able to go better and get a silver medal was was great like we were never going to beat the americans they're always so strong like it's crazy i think like the us manage every single olympics to just find like three or four new guys that are swimming 47 lows or 46 highs and it's just yeah i mean some days i wish i was on the american swim team to be able to uh (laughs) be a part of some of their relays and and have some of the success they've been able to have over the the last three olympics i've been a part of but um yeah i kind of expect that they're going to beat us and we're battling it out for the minor medals so to be to be on the silver podium was was awesome yeah I, yeah, it's it's uh, a little a little mind blowing how the U.S. is able to manage 
to <laughs> keep their sprint depth every quad and kind of do so at the right time. Because, you know, obviously last year at Worlds, you guys were on top. Yeah. And, uh, you know, you were able to conduct conduct a victory at that point. Um, yeah. But, yeah, it is a little like, how, how does that happen? But, you you know, again, you guys had a great race. You put up some really good times. And uh, and then, you know, you, you, you split 46-5 heading into the individual 100 free, which it's your third time. It's your third go around with that at the Olympics. But coming in, we have the fastest field in history, yeah. right? We've got Popovich. We've got Pan. Uh, you've got, you know, Jack Alexi, uh, I mean, like the list goes on, like it was so deep and so many guys who, who had a shot at, uh, meddling at winning. So how, how do you manage that? And how do you, how are you feeling, especially after that 46, five and seeing pan go 46, nine on the lead off, yeah. um, into the, into the heats and the semis. Yeah, I mean, I was obviously that really lifted my confidence swimming that fast in the relay, um, which was great. Obviously, I'm able to swim faster in relays because I get the I get the fly start, so it makes it easier. I dive in behind, so I get to ride a bit of wash. So I've swum some pretty crazy times in relays just from people carrying me, probably. But um, <laughs> it did lift my confidence a lot because it was one of my fastest relay swims I've ever done, and we'd won silver, and so I knew I was swimming well, which was great, and I just had to relax for two days before getting into the heat um but yeah knowing that i was going in as the fourth fastest uh 100 freestyle i like with the fourth fastest personal best time um was kind of scary i guess in a way but it also was really it played into my favor because then i become the underdog again like i won in rio but then i'm still the underdog in tokyo and i remember leading into tokyo like my name was completely out of the list of of contenders for that medal uh, or the gold medal, and that kind of motivated me to get my hand on the wall second. I mean, I tried my best to get first, but um, to get second was special. But, um, yeah, this time around, having guys swimming 46s consistently now, uh, I knew that I was going to be in for a serious dogfight and fighting um, my very best. But I think I swam in the heat and um, swam next to Pan and uh, beat, him, beat him pretty comfortably. So I guess after the heat, that gave me... Gave me a bit of confidence again also like he was 48 4 just scraped through the semi-final i thought or oh, maybe he's a little bit off um i, I yeah. won my heat by, uh, quite a lot so i thought i was swimming so fast because i had a really good heat of like i can't remember exactly who was in there now but pan and josh leando edwards was in there and a guy that i trained with josh Saucho was in there and there was someone else who was pretty quick oh matt richards was in there also yeah and uh Guy karib yeah matt richards pan yeah so for me, I like to look at those things and go, oh, yeah, I'm, if I can win my heat, I progress through the semifinal pretty comfortably. So I, all I wanted to do was win that heat, and it took a 48-0, which is pretty great, like very slow, I thought. Like I thought I was flying being ahead of those guys pretty comfortably. <laughs> and then, um, again, same thing. I was in the semifinal, but in the first semi, so I knew I had to swim very fast to progress through to the final. Um, and most of the main guys were in the second semi, so it put the pressure on me to deliver something fast. And I really wanted to be in a in a middle lane because I think that that's somewhat what cost me in Tokyo a little bit was I went a little bit easier in the semi final because I had the four by two hundred freestyle relay that night. So mm -hmm. I tried to be a bit more tactical with it to save myself a bit for the relay, which meant I was in lane seven and breathing to my right on the way home. All I could see was. Um, some Wu Huang on the way home. I couldn't see where the rest of the field was, which uh, makes a big difference being able to breathe towards guys and, and be able to ride the wash like being next to Caleb would have been would have been amazing. But um, so I wanted to make sure I set myself up to be in a in a middle lane with the fastest guys for the final. And then um, again, had a good sleep because I was happy with my race, had a good sleep that night and able to get up and have a little bit of a relax in the morning, like sleep in, have a float in the pool, went home, had a nap and um, get myself ready for the final. The final was late, like it was 10.45 p.m., I think, uh, mm. France yeah. time. So pretty, it's a long day to wait around. Like, it's like, yeah, it's a very, like the semifinal was 8.30. So we had 26 hours to prepare for the final, um, yeah. which is a lot of time in your own head. But I think 
that's where it plays into my favor that I've been there three times and I'm able to, I know that feeling so well now, like from swimming at Worlds and Com Games and these big moments. Mm -hmm. I'm able to draw my experience a lot and just enjoy it. And I think for me, that was my biggest goal this year, being at my third Olympics was just slowing down and enjoying the moment, something I've worked so hard for to be there and enjoy the Olympic experience, like enjoy walking out in front of 17,000 supporters, having Maxime in the final, them all chanting Maxime because the like of having a French crowd was gave me goosebumps being out there. Like I was like, this is so sick. This is something I've worked so hard for that I want to enjoy rather than being so locked in and focused and Something that else that really played into my favor was being um, in the marshing room this time around. I like to talk. I'm not a person that puts my headphones on and gets too serious. So having um, one of my training partners, Joshua Saucho from Germany in the in the marshing room with me and being able to just talk about things from home and things completely away from swimming for 20 minutes was the greatest thing for my preparation to race. Like I was able to just stay relaxed until I stood behind the blocks. Um, and then, yeah, we, we dove in for the race. Uh, I turned turned eighth, which is pretty common for me, but I knew that I was pretty far behind. And then I was breathing towards Pan on the way home and I thought, oh, this is great. I, I'm breathing towards Pan. I'm breathing towards Popovici. I'm breathing towards Alexi on the way home. I know where these guys are going to be. Like, this is the perfect situation for me. Like, could not play it into my favour anymore. But when I was breathing, all I could see was Pan's feet. Like I couldn't see anything else. And I, I don't think I've ever been beaten by body length in my time in 100 freestyle ever in my life. So in my mind, I'm thinking, holy shit, I've had the worst race of my, my career in the Olympic final. Like this is embarrassing. I'm getting beaten by a whole body length. Like there's no way he can be beating the whole field by a body length. I have to be dead last. Like that's all I could see is his feet splashing. So I had no idea. Yeah. Um, so it was a big shock again when I touched the wall and saw silver. And for me, I think if he was to have swam 47.2 seconds and my personal best time could have won the Olympic gold medal, I probably would have been a little bit disappointed in myself and been like, oh, if I swam my best, I could have could have won. But for him to swim 46.4 seconds, I know that there's no way that I was ever going to swim 46.39 seconds. So for me, winning silver was was like winning like it was it was amazing to get my hand on the wall second again and win my third individual medal in the 100 freestyle and i'm so proud of that and to be a part of a race where the world record was absolutely demolished um is pretty cool like i think that race is going to be watched <laughs> for a very very long time moving forward and i'm in that race so i'll be able to show my kids it one day and be proud that i was a part of the fastest ever uh, 100 freestyle at the olympic games no kidding right i mean that uh, that race uh i think that was on night five so it was like in the middle of the meet i think we've we've talked about it a lot at this point that was the best session of racing f from our perspective because you had leon's double it was sure. like the two fly two breasts and then it it you had the women's hundred free at the beginning you had the men's hundred free like there were so many good races that night and then to end with that race, <laughs> you know, in this like insane world record, it was just like, oh, what? Yeah. It was, uh, yeah, it was jaw dropping, I think. Like, I remember touching the wall and going from diving in where the crowd's going crazy. And I think the crowd was just stunned. Like, it was, it was silent for a little bit. Like, no yeah. one knew really what to say or cheer or what. Like, it was just, it was wild. And, but yeah, I agree. That night was amazing. And I think it turned the competition around in the terms of the slow pull, the slow pull right. talk massive until then and then it's like well leon's just broken two olympic records tonight i'm pretty sure <laughs> yeah. and, yeah. and then and then pam broke the world record and the and the olympic record in the 100 freestyle like i think it then changed the narrative of the competition um so yeah that was that was a wild night of racing especially <laughs> warming up and watching that unfold like sarah to get her hand on the wall first and that 100 freestyle was amazing from an outside lane and um, yeah, it was cool. It was a cool thing to be a part of, especially as a massive swimming fan, being able to watch some of those narratives unfold and the races unfold. It's like, oh, this is, this is awesome. I'm so glad to be part of that. <laughs> no kidding. Yeah. I mean, it was, it was so fun to watch. Um, I mean, I don't, have you thought about that time much? I mean, like 46, four is just unreal to me. I mean, it's like, right. It's so fast. Like, it is. Like, there's, there's no words for it or how to put like, 
even even for me to describe it to non-swimming fans or my friends, it's like there's been some fast relay swims in time in the top, like like Lezak and Duncan Scott and Elaine Bernard, I think, had a fast relay swim. And then there's been some fast relay swims. I've had some fast relay swims, but like his his time individually without a super suit. 46.4 like ranks with the very best relay splits of all time. Like it's hard to put into words how unbelievable that is. But I think it's also exciting for the 100 freestyle because it forces us all to progress. Mm -hmm. And like it's something that I've said recently in the media is like I've been 47.0 twice, you know, over the last five years especially. I've always believed that I've been capable of swimming 46.9. Like I would love to swim 46.9. And I remember when Caleb swam that in 2019 and seeing that 46.9 on the on the board, like blew my mind completely. Like I never thought that that was possible until Caleb did that. Mm -hmm. And now you have 46.4, like it really <laughs> changes the goalpost, right? Like for me, if I want to be competitive in that event, I have to train to swim that fast. Like I have to, I train so hard. Like I believe that I train harder than anyone. That's something that I've always believed is like and had to believe is i'm the hardest trainer in this event and that's what's carried me over the line is like being the fittest guy that has the fastest back end the fastest closing speed and finishing but if i want to be competitive that's a time that i now have to dream possible to race against pan or race against david because i know that they're only going to get faster and better like they're young guys and there's going to be more guys in the world that drop down to 46 swimming so it's exciting for the event in 100 freestyle it's 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 also exciting from from a fan's perspective for me to watch the how how these guys are carrying themselves like talking to David Popovich like his he, he is mentally on another planet I feel like than most humans which is really cool and then to hear um, Pan say like I don't know if you saw this there was an interview he did with Chinese media before the meet where he was like don't publish this mm -hmm. but like i'm gonna go way faster than 46 8 and I did something along those lines. <laughs> yeah and he's like and so i think it's gonna be good that my competition thinks 46 8 is like w my my top end um yeah. but it so it's it's cool to hear these guys and hear mentally how they're approaching the sport but also to hear that you know, I think I'm pretty sure Pan was like, Kyle's my hero. Yeah, <laughs> like, I look up to him. Like, how how does it feel for you to be a part of that heat and be a part of this history? But then also know that you're you're one of these people who's ushering in this new wave of guys in this event. It's really weird. I think like it's it's so satisfying and so nice. And like, I love that these guys because there's been so many guys, like I remember last year at World Championships talking to Matt Richards in the marching room and him saying, oh yeah, I've looked up to you and this is such an honor to be able to race against you. This is before the final, like walking out before the final. And then I hadn't spoken to Pan at all to that point. And just before our names got announced before the final, he said, he turned to me and said, oh, you are my idol and um, it's an honor to race against you. And like in that moment, I was kind of like, is he just trying to get in my head or what's going on here? Like, I didn't know he spoke English to that point. And I was like, well, this is such an honor. And then like it come to this Olympics and then I have even more people like even David come up to, after the race was like, you know, you're someone that I've looked up to for such a long time and someone I've drawn so much inspiration from in how you swim. And something that we've always worked together is with my coaches is trying to emulate what you've done, how you swim the 100 freestyle. And Pan had a big chat to me like after our 100 freestyle we had a big chat with his coaches and I kind of said about how I'm going to come to the Shanghai World Cup and he said oh you're, you're my idol he said again you're, you've always been my idol and I never believed it that I would be able to race against you or be in the race with you and and now I'm beating you um was was nice and and then and guys that I don't know all that well coming up to me and saying oh it's an honor to race against you and like it's just I had a lot of that this time around it's nice, but it's also weird because it's like, I guess I'm getting older and I'm getting to that end of my career, I guess. <laughs> like there's still the, the Florent Manadou's swimming that I've looked up to and I guess it's similar to them. Like I remember meeting Flo for the first time and saying that to Flo or Bruno Frattis and being like, you know, you guys are guys that I've looked up to my whole swimming career. This is such an honor for me to be able to talk to you and be friends with you. And now it's kind of been put onto me, which which is an honor and really cool, but... 
I still got to, I still want to race against those guys and be competitive against those <laughs> guys too. So I can't let it just sink in too much. Like, um, yeah, I still want to make sure I'm earning my stripes and they can still look up to me for a few more years. Yeah, yeah, that's, I'm, I'm sure that's a weird thing to balance of like, oh that's yeah, I'm, I'm, you know, I've, I've made my mark, but also I want to continue making my mark. For sure, it's special and, and like, I don't want to settle on it too much and just be like, oh, maybe I have, maybe I have done my time in swimming and like, you know, maybe that, maybe this is my time to transition because everyone's looking up to me, but I don't want to transition yet. Like I want to, I want to continue to swim and I'm already looking at the LA 2028 Olympic pool and starting to think about that and how cool that will be being in the second week of competition in front of 30 plus thousand yeah. people in the stadium in America, I think will be. And, you know, there's always Americans in the final in the 100 freestyle and the four by one freestyle. So I can expect the crowd <laughs> to be even louder than what it was this time around in France. No kidding. So, um, so you're already, you're already thinking ahead. You've, you've got no intention of slowing down. No, no way. I think I love swimming. I love being an athlete. I love the lifestyle. For me, I want, I'm, well, I've already, I'm on doing World Cups, which would be awesome. And then preparing for World Short Course at the end of the year. And I think that that's always been something I've had to do is start thinking about the next competition instead of just being like happy and complacent with what's just happened and unwinding and relaxing. It's like, well, I can do that, but I still want, I still want more. And I still know that I have more to give and I'm excited to get back in the pool and I'm excited. Like it's so good talking to my, coach of 13 years peter bishop and starting to think about like him, him starting to be like break down that race with me at in paris and be like you know these are the areas i think you can improve on and i spoke to him on the phone for an hour and a half this morning about those sorts of little things that he thinks that i could do better or i've done better in the past and how i can improve so i love that i love finding a way to improve and um i'm looking forward to getting back in the pool i think it's so good for the mind just being underwater and that's where I'm, that's my comfort zone. And that's where I'm happiest is when I'm in the pool. So I'm looking forward to, to getting back in and preparing. Maybe, maybe I haven't thought too much about the Olympics, but to start thinking about the next, you know, World Cups first and then World Short Course and take it from there. Yeah. Do you, at this point, do you know where and who you will be training with moving forward? Uh, no, I'm not hundred percent sure. I'm, I'm desperate to be back in Adelaide. Like Adelaide's my, my home, the South Australia is the place that I'm so, I'm so proud to be South Australian and live in Adelaide. And at the end of last year, I was able to buy a new house and move into a new house. And I now have a fiance and we've got a puppy together and my life, like my mum lives with me in Adelaide and Temp, Matthew Temple, my best mate, lives with me in Adelaide, and like my life is is South Australia and is Adelaide. What do you need? Exactly. Like being away from that this year has been very hard. Like I've pretty much been away, living out of a suitcase since the end of February, from being on the Sunshine Coast onto here. So I'm yeah. really looking forward to getting back to Adelaide, and I'm desperate to have my coach Peter Bishop back. Like he's guided me to, uh, or guided me through everything. We've been together for 13 years, and he's guided me to every international title I've ever had. Or guided me to the person I am today massively in and out of the pool. Uh, so I desperately want to get back to working with him also. So that's the big goal. I'll be back in Adelaide, be with him and um, take it from there. Yeah. I'm, I'm curious just if you've reflected on kind of the last few months leading up to this and how, I mean, I, I have to, I have to, I have to admit something and I'm not proud of this. I did not pick you to medal at this meet. <laughs> and I'm, okay. and I said, I hope you do. Yeah. <laughs> but, um, you know, it's like you, at trials, I didn't realize you were sick, but you know, it's like you were dealing with injuries. You would, you'd had to switch coaches. You would had to move your life. It's like you, you had a, a lot of road bumps. Um, yeah. and to like, to not all, I mean, I feel like even just getting to this meet, it was a huge accomplishment with everything you went through, but have you reflected on that at all in the last couple of days of just how, how much you did go through? And maybe at this point, it, that's just kind of, that's just kind of normal for you. Right. Yeah. I mean, you've dealt with a lot of stuff like this before. I know I have dealt with so many things and it's like, I know there's people out there that try and say, I'm trying to make excuses or whatnot at times, but it's like, that's life. I mean, yeah, it is. <laughs> like, 
I, I truly believed at the end of last year, like I won, I won at Commonwealth Games, then I won World Short Course, then I won World Championships. So I ticked all the boxes. And at the end of the last year, I was really believing in my head. I've overcome every possible challenge that can come my way in sport, whether it's like injury, mental health, media challenges, family breakdowns, you name it, I've had to go through it that I don't believe this year there's going to be any problems. Like it's going to be smooth sailing and I just get to enjoy that. Like there's no, <laughs> like I, I think I've got the capability to deal with whatever comes my way. And then I lost my coach and like my coach is like, he means so much to me as like a father figure and friend and coach obviously. And like, he's one of the, if not the most important people in my life. So that was so hard to deal with and i don't think that i have spoken about how hard that really was to deal with and i don't think that i've had time to sit down and actually reflect on it because it's just like well this is what's happened you either be sad about it or you get on with it and you i've got the olympic games to think about and prepare for and do my very best to 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 ride this this challenge like and i was very lucky that my very best mate is a coach up on the sunshine coast and i was able to go up there and that was the very best thing for me, like to be with him and his family, like his two young kids mean the world to me. Like I've, they call me Uncle Kyle and like picking them up from school or dropping them off to school or playing PlayStation with them and having dinners as a family was the best thing for me mentally and emotionally through that period that uh, it, it, it helped drag me out of my slump that I definitely was in in that last couple of weeks in Adelaide because that was a very stressful period that went on for quite a long time until they made a decision um so i found that very challenging and i wasn't allowed to speak with bish through that period um so that was quite hard not having him in my day-to-day -day life um but then through that then then we were able to reconnect and be friends and i know that i know now that it's all going to be okay like he's going to be back on deck coaching very soon i don't know when or where but very very soon which excites me because i know that there's there's light at the end of the tunnel but through that period was hard, but being able to have him in my corner and speak to me on the phone every day was what got me through. And also joining a new squad of like 14, you know, not on the Olympic team or Australian team, like amateur swimmers, I guess, that are trying to make it was forced me out of my slump too, because these guys are like looking up to me and trying to draw, draw inspiration off from me. And they're trying to ask me questions and they're all idolizing and looking up to me. And I found that very special that like I really, really enjoyed that. And it forced me to be, take on a leadership role. And um, I don't know how to put it into words really, but like to be me, it forced me to be me. It forced me to be the hardest trainer in the pool. It forced me to be a professional, get there on like earlier than the rest of them, do all of my prehab, rehab, show them how the best in the world train and how I train and inspire them that it is possible to make the Olympic team and do well. So. Um, I really enjoyed that challenge of being up there. But um, I think, to be honest, like, yeah, I, I've just come off the Olympic Games. It's a huge high. Now I'm in Norway unwinding and celebrating my engagement with my fiancé's friends and family. And I think once I get home to Adelaide, it's going to be, yeah, time for me to really probably break down this year and how it all unfolded and have conversations and start to prepare for the next the next phase of swimming and, and what I want desperately. And, uh, and yeah, I look forward to being back in Adelaide. And I think there's a lot of people that probably can, didn't consider me winning a medal this year, but I see that as a challenge. Like I know, I, I read the articles, I read Swim Swam, I love Swim Swam. So that I, that I see and I, I appreciate you saying that because then I'm like, I'm gonna prove this guy wrong. Like that's how my mindset's always been, it's like, Oh, you're going to write me off? Then sweet, I'm going to prove you wrong, and I'm going to I'm going to achieve something that even yeah, I agree. I didn't I didn't believe as possible um, through trials. Like to make the team was amazing because I did believe. Oh, who knows what's going to happen? Like I've never had to change coaches in my life. I never saw myself living outside of South Australia and now living in Queensland. I've moved my whole life up here and living out of a suitcase for three months. Like it wasn't easy at all. Like it was like. I, yeah i mean i could go on about it for ages but like it was not comfortable in terms of like sassy we've been going on, on like our institute in south australia we go on training camps we might have five athletes and five to six support staff in mm. malaysia and there's like amazing conditions and everything's done for you and looked after like we went on our training camp with saint andrews to Mackay, 
and we were there as 14 athletes, one coach, and we stayed in a backpackers. Like, <laughs> like no fridge, no cooking facilities, nothing for two weeks. So, like, wow. I'm lucky that I'm resilient and, and grounded <laughs> enough to get through that, but I think that a lot of the top-end swimmers in the world would not accept that for a training camp in preparation for our Olympic <laughs> trials, just be like, this is this is too hard, this is not okay. But for me, it's like, yeah, I'm going to stay in this backpack is where all these guys are partying and keeping us up all night, find a way to rise above this challenge. Like, I think it's why I've got resilience and why I can be injured at trials and swim poorly, but then get to the big competition and be like, this is what I need to do. This is what I'm desperate to do. Like, I'm so hungry to have success. I want this more than anyone else in this race. Like, this is this is my purpose and what I live for. This is what I how I want to... You know, I want to set myself up for life. Like I want to take advantage of those moments. I want to be remembered in swimming and have that legacy in that big moment. So this is how this is what I have to do right now. Like I've got 47 seconds to deliver my best possible performance. Yeah. And I again I'm I'm so happy for you that you did. It's it was so cool to, to watch that. And you know, and uh yeah, like it wasn't had nothing to do with you know you're the defending world or you were the defending world champion the doha meet was weird you know but um but yeah it's like it's to see you go through so much and uh you know you never know you never know what's going on with the person except for like what we're reporting but we had reported so much and it's like oh my man it's like it's a lot but you, you came out the other side and you got three medals. <laughs> it's like, that's, it's, it's insane. Big congrats. We were talking off camera before this, you have some big out of the pool changes. You just got engaged. You're in, you're in Norway now celebrating that you got engaged, made the Olympic team and had a birthday all within like one week. <laughs> yeah. Um, the, yeah. So it's like, you had a big time. So, what are the, what are the next uh you, you talked about it a little bit just to wind down from this interview what do the next couple of weeks look like for you in the immediate future of uh i know you get to go home and um what is what does relaxation for you look like yeah i mean firstly that yeah that week was a whirlwind it was like being brisbane qualify for the olympic games amazing go back home I knew that Ingi was going back to, to Norway and I was going to the Olympic Games, but I really wanted to get engaged before we went our separate ways so we could kind of have that celebration, something I've been preparing, obviously, for a while. It's not something that just happens overnight. So that was one of my, the happiest days in my life when she said yes to that. So that was awesome. And then and then actually the end of the week, like the day I boarded the flight to, to France, I actually lost uh, a hugely important person in my life um, their battle with cancer so then it just becomes crashing down to a massive yeah. lull and it's like oh this is really hard and like I know I should be back in Port Lincoln with my family and friends I guess celebrating his life um, and being there with the people I love but I've also got the Olympic Games and speaking to his son who's one of my very best friends was you know got to go over there and you got to win for Benj which gave me that motivation and gave me that I can feel Benj with me through this competition, I'm doing it for him. It gave me that superpower, I guess, that I desperately needed. And then and then it was my birthday. <laughs> so it was just like this whirlwind, crazy week. Like this was all within one week with the highs and lows and like messages and messages of what was going on. Yeah. Um, but for me, yeah, I, I desperately need to get back home to Australia. Firstly, probably attend, like be back home in Port Lincoln to be with, be with the family and um, friends and uh, loved ones and celebrate such an important person's life to me who passed and pay my respects and um, uh, be there for them. So that's that's something, go back to Port Lincoln, be with my grandparents, be with my family, um, which is country South Australia, just be over there. I'm also, um, my, my local country football team, it's their last round of football and um, I'm one of the major sponsors of the team and I'm also on the board of the team so it's um i've been i haven't been able to be at any games this year because i've been living on the sunshine coast and then over here so i think it's important that i get back and do that and i just really want to desperately give back to the community as much as i can like um go visit the schools in port lincoln and go down to the local swimming pool and see the see the club and do the local media and do all the right things by the community that's been there for me so much like it's a town of thirteen thousand people so 
I know that I wouldn't have been able to be there without them through my career. So I think it's very important that the first thing I always do is go back and give back to them as much as I can. And then, and then, it, and then it'll be crazy from there on out. I think back when I get back to Adelaide in terms of sponsorship and media commitments, and I'm flying over to Las Vegas for UFC um, 306, I'm a massive Sugar Sean fan. So I'm going to be in Vegas with a few of my mates, um, which is exciting, something to really look forward to. But um, I think, you know, I'm 26 now. My priority list has changed in terms of what happens after the Olympic Games. Like it's, for me, it's about spending time with the family and friends and loved ones that have been there every step of the way with me and be there with my fiance and just unwind and relax and be with my dog and be in my house and in my bed and the things that I love <laughs> to do. So I'm looking forward to, to that, like desperate, desperately um counting down the hours almost until it's time to get back to australia well yeah big congrats kyle i i i can't imagine how long have you been gone at this point for three three weeks four weeks eight, eight weeks oh so we God. pretty much like I, I well to be fair even longer like i left adelaide in february yeah i was there in, i was up in the sunshine coast until um trials which was in brisbane so then i got i did trials in brisbane flew back to adelaide i had five days in adelaide which was nice so it was pretty much like okay. unpack everything from the three months repack for the olympic games get engaged yeah. and then um and then be on the road again like we had this is this is my eighth week um over in europe so yeah very very excited to to get back and be in adelaide so it's um it's an exciting it's a very exciting now <laughs> well, Kyle, it's it's great talking to you as always. Thank you so much for taking the time on your on your wedding celebration week. And uh, yeah, good good luck getting home. And I hope you get some some much deserved rest time. Appreciate it. Thank you so much. And thank you for all all who's watching this. Like we obviously really appreciate the support that comes through Swim Swam. And like me, I'm a massive fan and, and read all the comments and stuff. So I do appreciate all the great comments and I appreciate you being a great mate of mine now that I love being able to get on a podcast with you and be so open and honest and talk and whatnot. So on behalf of me, I'm very grateful. On behalf of other swimmers, we're very grateful for you and uh, building our sport and loving our sport. So thank you. You've been listening to the Swim Swam podcast. Stay tuned for new episodes every week. You can take Swim Swim Podcasts on the go by subscribing on your favorite podcast platform. Look for links in the description below and be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel for more videos as well.